Good morning, everyone. We are so happy that you are tuned in. Uh, please comment and like so that we know that you're there and share the feed so that other people can enjoy with you. We're going to begin with some worship. Seven into your eyes makes my heart come alive. Suddenly brought to life when I met you. Reaching beyond the skies, running deep, stretching wide. Perfect love realized here with you. Now this love is for real, you will never let go, never let go. Oh, it's more than just words, love beyond my control, out of control. This is real love, this is real love. And this is real love, this is real love. Oh. You're pulling me closer and closer, holding my heart to the very end. And Jesus, I'm found in your freedom. This is real love, this is real love. In your heart, I'm found. I want you, I want you. And you won't let me down. You got me, you got me. And this love is for real, you will never let go, never let go. Oh, when it's more than just words, love be on my control, out of control. You're pulling me closer and closer, holding my heart to the very end. And Jesus, I'm found in your freedom. This is real love, this is real love. Whoa.
Surrounding me, let it break at your name. Still, call the sea to still, the rage in me to still every way at your name. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness. 
I'm Pastor Clint. I want to welcome you uh, to our live stream of Cicero Valley Church. Uh, we are a church with a vision to be a church that the unchurched love to experience. And we have a mission, with, and that is the following Jesus, changing together. So we're so glad that you're tuning in today, uh, checking us out online, maybe your first time, or, or just uh, been doing that for the last 10 weeks, and we appreciate that. Uh, we want to let you know that we are a church to pray together. Um, so uh, you can see a link below to fill out a prayer request, maybe uh, if you've got prayer that you need right now, we want to pray for you. Um, and so fill out that, uh, that link for the prayer request. Or maybe you haven't been getting the prayer uh, list, you can do that there too. Um, also, we've got online family content. We're going to continue to do that throughout this season uh, that we have. And, and so uh, go to sistervalleychurch.com. We've got awesome stuff for you to do with the whole family uh, to stay connected and grow in the Lord. Uh, also, you can fill out a connection card. So maybe you're checking us out for the first time, or maybe you have some comments, concerns, way that we can do better, uh, or maybe there's something that God's laid on your heart, a decision that you make today. Uh, we would love to hear about that. And so in the link below, you just fill out that connection link. Uh, that represents our card, and that we, comes to us, and we can contact you or, or uh, just be... Uh, informed of what you want us to know. Uh, right now, we're going to have a time of offering. This really is part of our service. So there are three ways to give. You can give through the website, through the app, and through uh, a mail. You can mail in a check. And so uh, we're going to pray for that offering uh, right now. Lord, I just lift up this offering to you, God. I pray for this service. I pray for the reopening of uh, our area. God, that that will go smooth and that will go well. God, I pray that you'll continue to use our church to glorify you and the funds that come in to do that. I pray for Pastor Allen as he brings a message for us today uh, to deal with family. And because we've all got families and sometimes they're good, bad, messy, or perfect. And I don't know a perfect family, but God, I know I'm a part of your perfect family one day. And I'm excited about that. Uh, God, I just lift you up. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Allen. And... Uh... We're excited. <laughs> Beginning next week, we can actually meet in person. Uh, so some of you obviously can join us. Some of, some of you will need to stay home. We've got a slide with what we're projecting is going to happen next week. And uh, first, it's going to be a ch touch-free experience. We're going to try and have the doors open. And of course, no contact between people other than your family. And uh, that will be next week. Um, no children's ministry allowed yet, so if you want to bring your children, they're going to have to sit with you uh, quietly and, and not move around in the sanctuary. Uh, we will have both services. We're planning to have both services. Everybody is supposed to wear a mask unless you're up on stage, so we'll, we'll have one, even uh, staff will have one when we're with people, but we'll have it off when we're up, up front. And then when you're seated, <laughs> we're required families to be seven feet apart, so we'll figure, try and figure that out as best we can. We'll give you some more updates uh, later in the week, and uh, we'll give it a try next week, and it'll be exciting. So thank you.
Good morning again. This is Pastor Allen, and uh, we're in a series. We like to talk on, uh, on messages that are in a series on a certain topic. And starting last week, we started a new series called Ideal Family. And today's topic is Power Down. This is probably the most important uh, message in this series as far as making your family uh, better, your relationships better. And another exciting thing about today's message, it is for everyone. The principle we're going to talk about, and we've talked about it before, but the principle we're going to talk about is applicable for Jesus followers or people that aren't Jesus followers. And so if you're not, we're delighted you're with us, and uh, we'll get to that principle in a, in a few minutes. Now in this series, we're talking about the, the tension between the real and the ideal. Now... The real thing is we all have uh, somewhat dysfunctional families. Uh, maybe you've been married a short amount of time and marriage is harder than you thought it was going to be. And maybe you're going through a divorce and that first marriage didn't work. Maybe you're in a second marriage and it isn't as easy as you thought it would be. Maybe you have kids and they're driving you crazy, especially now. Uh, maybe you wish you had kids and you don't have kids. Maybe you've got some prodigal kids that are just kind of gone off the deep end. So, that's the reality. But there is an ideal, uh, quote unquote, the perfect family, which doesn't exist here on earth. So the question is, what do we do about the difference between <laughs> the ideal uh, and what's real? And w we have this idea in our society or this desire in our society that people shouldn't feel bad. <laughs> One of the goopy things we do is this. If you've been on a sports team or some other team, everybody gets a trophy at the end. And everybody realizes it's not worth anything because everybody gets one. doesn't matter if you did well or didn't do well, if you goofed off, didn't goof off. And so it doesn't really have any value. But we don't want any children to feel bad. <laughs> because somebody else got a trophy, and they didn't. So when we think about it, though, all of us want better, I think, for our family. Um, so we wish the, uh, we could be married for 50 years uh, to that same person. We wished our kids would grow up and be responsible, etc. So no matter if culture is telling us it's, it's okay that your, <laughs> your family's messed up, um, no, no, it's not okay. Um, there's something better. We want better. And we talked about this last week. Jesus, <laughs> he comes along, and instead of saying, oh, it's okay, uh, we don't want you to feel bad, he made it worse. He uh, just upped the, 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 the bar. He upped the bar. He, he jacked up the bar, and he said, okay. <laughs> he, he pointed to an ideal, yet refused to condone those who fell short. You've heard it's been said you, sh you can't murder. Well, no, no, no. It really means you can't hate anybody. <laughs> uh, you've heard it, you, you shouldn't commit adultery. Well, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's worse than that. You shouldn't even lust after somebody. So instead of making us feel better, so to speak, Jesus has made us feel worse because we all really fallen short of those ideals. But on the other hand, he made us feel better in that there is a forgiveness. There is uh, uh, grace. Uh, we have the satisfaction in there that God's grace is sufficient to make up for our shortcomings. Now, if you, most of us, are Jesus followers, do we have an option about this? Is it optionable? Optional. The things we talked about last week that the Bible talks about family. Well, no, it's, it's not optional. We'll talk about that uh, at the end this morning. We said last week, we have a Bible, we look at all these families in the Old Testament, there's no good examples, <laughs> none. Uh, King David wasn't, wasn't a good, uh, the, the, first, the first family. Uh, Abraham, uh, all these folks, they, they had really dysfunctional families, they're really not good examples. So then Jesus comes along and, and he dies and then the New Testament writers are trying to implement Jesus' teaching uh, 
it, as it applies to all of life, but as we're talking about, it applies to family. And we came up with four kind of conclusions from the New Testament writers, mostly Paul and Peter. Husbands, love your wives. Unconditionally, totally, completely. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. Uh, we talked about some other words, uh, support. <laughs> uh, submit's kind of a buzzword. Children, obey your parents. And fathers, don't <laughs> aggravate your children. Now, when we read that list and we think about the list, I don't know about your reaction. My reaction is failed, failed, failed. <laughs> so what do I do about that? Because I've failed to love my wife all the time. I've loved, uh, I've failed at not aggravating my children. So we're going to pick out one today to talk about specifically. And let me ask you, which is the most politically incorrect in the list? That's pretty easy to figure out, right? Wives, submit to your husbands. Now we're going to see this is an application of a principle that is uh, good for, or, or should be applied to everyone. This, this reference is application is to, is, is to wives. So this is in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Paul wrote this. He says, wives, this means, and we'll get back to this means in a minute, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Uh, another translation uses a different word. Wives, this means be as supportive of your husbands like you were tenderly devoted to our Lord. Now, you may have pushed back to the word submit, but if you loved your husband, I would assume you would agree that you should be supportive. Now, Jesus boiled down his whole ministry into this statement, love one another as I have loved you. And so, as a wife, <laughs> I believe this verse is just saying, love your husbands just as I, Jesus, love you. Another way to, to, to phrase that is this way, or ask yourself this question. What does love require of me? As a, as a wife, what does love require of me in my relationship to my husband? This is the driving ethic of Jesus, of the church, of Christianity. Love one another as I have loved you. So, what does that look like in your family? Now, we looked at first century culture last week. And in first century culture, well, this followed the Egyptians and the Greeks, and now the Romans in control. The <clears throat> ethic was might makes right. The strongest people could do what they wanted because nobody else could stop them. And so the Romans went around doing whatever they wanted because they were strongest. And that's why men controlled their families. Women and children had little power because they were stronger. Jesus comes along and changes all that. And we're going to see, basically, turns it upside down. So one verse previous to wives submit to your husbands, Paul says this. And so it's really important to read it in context. He says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Oh, that's a little bit different, right? It's just not wives. It's everyone. <laughs> Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Or out of reverence for Christ, be supportive of each other. Now, that word awe, uh, reverence, sometimes we can use the word awe or respect. So, out of awe or respect to Jesus, I'm going to submit myself to each other. So, we call this mutual submission. Mutual submission. So it's just not wives. <laughs> it's everyone. If you're a Jesus follower, you are to be submissive to everyone or be supportive to everyone or to love everyone or to respect everyone. So, as a husband, I'm supposed to love my wife first and foremost more than anything else. And my life... Honestly, I've got a great wife, but she's not always lovable, right? Wives, submit to your husbands, and I know the pushback. My husband's not worth submitting to, and that may be true. Uh, children, obey your parents. Well, my parents hadn't had original thoughts since the 90s. Oh, maybe, maybe they're old-fashioned, but the Scripture's still true. And then, 
fathers don't aggravate your kids. But my kids are aggravating me. That's, that's the bigger problem. So what does it mean? Well, mutual submission means this. I'm going to leverage my power, my resources, and my time for your benefit. That's what I'm going to do. Now, we don't need to look any farther than Jesus. That's exactly what Jesus did. He, he came to earth, lived, suffered, died, rose from the dead. Why? Because he put us first. He put us first. We can imagine this. 2,000 years ago up in heaven, God and Jesus were having this conversation. And God says, uh, things aren't going very well. And Jesus said, what can I do to help? And God said, you don't want to know. And Jesus said, yeah, yeah, I, I, I really want to know. He said, well, you're going to have to leave the glories of heaven. And we can't comprehend that. Leave the glories of heaven. Go to earth. Hang out with these ungodly people. Uh, eventually, you're gonna, they're going to reject you, they're going to torture you, and they're going to kill you. <laughs> and, of course, eventually you're going to come back to life and come back to heaven. And Jesus said, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to put our creation, mankind, first. Now, a perfect example of this was the last night of Jesus' life. He meets with the disciples uh, in the upper room we call Passover. Now, we happen to be in... Israel, not on Passover, it's not a Passover, but Passover week uh, last year. And this is the he biggest holiday in Israel, in Judaism. Uh, everything shuts down for the whole week. <laughs> anyway, um, he gets together with his disciples, and they get, they get together for this elaborate feast, Passover meal, and he takes off his outer garment, he gets uh, a towel and some water, and he goes around and he starts washing the disciples' feet. This is the most probably unexplainable, un most remarkable story in Scripture. <laughs> Almighty God going around washing people's feet. We should be washing his feet. We should be washing his whole body, and that's what Peter said. Yet he, God, humbled himself <laughs> to the place of washing feet. Lesson is what? <laughs> There's nothing that we are too humble for us as Jesus followers to do. But what he's really saying, the more power you have, he's God, the more power you have, the more you use it or humbly use it for the benefit of others. So the more power you have, the more submitting you do. This is a huge, powerful dynamic in all relationships, but especially uh, with family. So, um, show you a quick video to kind of show you the tension between the again the real and and the ideal. <laughs> Catch the ball! You gotta catch that! Um, I, I know it's the playoffs, but can I talk to you for a moment? Sure. Yeah. Um, I feel like the amount of time that you have spent watching football has been detrimental to the amount of quality interaction time that we have with our children. Um, it, okay. It's okay. just, it makes the kids and I feel kind of, um... Unwanted. Yes. Exactly. I had no idea that my actions were causing you to feel this way. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. I sincerely apologize for my selfishness, and I humbly ask for your forgiveness. I forgive you. Well, grab the kids. Let's do some arts and crafts. Catch the ball! Stick it! Okay, I think most of us can relate. Uh, the ideal, we wish our relationships would be like that. Sometimes, maybe a lot of the times they're not. So here's the question we're going to, and we've shared this before. The question is going to make all the difference in your family. The question that 
makes mutual submission a reality. And here it is. What can I do to help? Wife, what can I do to help? Kids, what can I do to help? Kids, parents, what can I do to help? So most of you aren't here, but let's practice that out loud because it might be hard to even get it out of our mouths. So those of you that are here and those at home, let's say it out loud. What can I do to help? Let's try it again. <laughs> what can I do to help? Basically, you're saying, I'm here for you. And isn't that what love is? I'm here for you. Another way of stating it, uh, put on the screen, I am loaning you me. I'm loaning you my power, my resources, my time. I'm loaning them to you. This would make a huge change in, in family dynamics. Now, Kids, if there's any kids watching, you want to see your parents faint and fall on the floor? <laughs> Especially teenagers. Walk in and say, hey, mom, dad, what can I do to help? Now, from the other perspective, or from the parent's perspective, I ask the question, do you know what this does to parent, the, the parent-child relationship? Now, I'm a parent. I raised four kids, uh, we homeschooled them and everything, so we had to spend a lot of time with our kids. And you're, you're looking for those teachable moments. The problem is because of the pressures of life and, and so forth, so often parenting gets negative, doesn't it? You're telling your kids what they shouldn't be doing, you're telling your kids what they should do that they're not doing. It's so easy to just get into that kind of negative negativity. So. Uh, one of the ways that you can break that ne negativity is not that you're going to do your schoolwork for your kids or their chores for your kids, but you can ask this question. What can I do to help you? Help you be a better student. Help you get your chores done. Help you, you know, get closer to Jesus. What can I do to help? And that helps us avoid all that negativity. Now, ladies, wives, um, well, husbands, obviously, before you go to work or when you get home, of course, some people are staying at home and working, but anyway, um, ask, what can I do to help? You know, I'm going to be gone today, but, you know, while I'm gone or when I get back, what can I do to help? Um, ladies, you can ask your husbands. Now, most time, your husbands are going to say what? I'm a husband, I know. I, my, my, my response can be, no, 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 I'm kind of grunting. Uh, no, I, I don't need any help. Um, I do ask my wife for help, especially that techie stuff, that computer stuff. She does help me a lot with that. But ladies, when you ask your husband the question, what you're really saying, I'm as aware of how difficult being a father and a husband is, you know, supporting the family, taking all the responsibility that you have. Now, one question that comes up here is the question of leadership. Who is the leader in the home. We would say the man is supposed to be the leader in the home. But if he's going around always saying, <laughs> what can I do to help? Um, how does that work out? And one reason, before we get to that, one reason we don't ask the question is this. The barrier is fear. The barrier is fear. Well, if I ask my wife, <clears throat> what can I do to help? She's going to want me to, you know, do something I've been avoiding for six months. You know, my house would be painting. It's been years. <laughs> what can I do to help? Well, you could paint, you know, paint the ceiling, whatever it might be. <clears throat> children, I know, children, you fear this because, oh, you, you, you're going to have to go out and weed the garden or wash the car, or your parents are going to give you more chores to do, right? So that's why you fear asking the question. <clears throat> um, so you just, we're afraid we're going to be taken advantage of. And... Will that happen sometimes? Yes. But does that exclude this, actually, command of Jesus? It, it doesn't. It doesn't remove that uh, principle of life to submit to one another just because we may be afraid that somebody will take advantage of us. So, again, the verse is this. Submit to one another out of reverence, not for your children or not for your spouse, but out of reverence for Christ. And as I already said, Jesus, 
theoretically asked this 2,000 years ago, and he wound up coming to earth and suffering to die. So what you're doing is you're offering yourself to others. Now, what fear does is this. It keeps us from what we truly want. We want to have good relationships. We want to have healthy families, as I talked about on Wednesday. Um, but the fear of asking the question is keeping us from that secret. It's kind of like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. She had the secret, clip, you know, tap your heels together three times, you go back to, to Kansas. Uh, she, ha she had the, the way to do it all the time. And so we had the way to make our families better. So don't let fear keep you from asking, what can I do to help? So, another way to ask it, what, what makes for a great family? It's when I offer me to you or to us, to, to the family. I'm offering me. I'm giving of my time, resources for us. Now, let me ask you a simple question, important question. Why not? Why wouldn't you ask that question if it's going to produce better relationships and, and better families? <clears throat> and the basic answer is selfishness, right? <laughs> I don't want to do what you want me to do. I want to do what I want to do. <clears throat> In fact, especially, I think, for men or husbands, fathers, we have this fear or this, not fear, but <clears throat> um, faulty, faulty thinking or logic that if I just get people, everybody in my family do what I want. If I get my wife to do what I want, if I get my kids to do what I want, I'll be happy. Well, the bottom line is, the truth is, you won't, but obviously you're never going to get your family to always do what you want anyway. And so it becomes a, a, a power struggle. So this question, what can I do to help, forces us to lean in rather than pull away. That fear causes the to pull away, right? Well, if I ask my wife what I can do to help, she's going to want me to, again, paint the ceiling. Well, flip it around. If I ask her and I paint the ceiling, I am leaning in. That has caused my wife and I to get closer. The fear of asking is keeping a barrier or separation. The reality is selfishness does not make us happy. Selflessness brings about happiness. When I ask that question and I'm able to do that, in my case for my wife, that brings us closer, that brings us closer to the ideal, this brings us uh, um, lovingly closer. It just does. Now, the problem is with that leadership issue. <laughs> does this mean that nobody ultimately has authority in the home? And I sometimes say it this way. Uh, Deb, what was your... I'd like to do what you want me to do this evening. She said, no, I want to do what you want to do this evening. Or I want to go to a restaurant. Well, I think you can go to restaurants now. <laughs> I want to go to the restaurant you want to go to. No, I said, no, no, I want to go to the restaurant you do. Uh, and, and you never do anything because you both are trying to submit to the other. And it's really not that complicated or difficult, I don't think. Sometimes, one of, all the time, one of us said, okay, I will, uh, I'll pick or, or you can do what you want to do. And, and I'm good with that. So there really isn't a conflict <laughs> between submission and authority. And I'm going to give you the pr prime example to explain that to you. It has everything to do with what we do with our authority. And here's the example. Here's the model. Jesus is the model, again. I don't think I've ever seen anybody argue or write saying, I don't believe Jesus was the head of the church. I just don't believe it. In fact, it's just the opposite. Nobody argues that. Why? Because <laughs> he submitted himself, he humbled himself to the place of torture and death for the church. So instead of it saying he can't be the head, it proves that he's the head, doesn't it? So men, if you're going to be the leader in your home, and sometimes we think as men, 
My wife would be a much better leader. Why, why is she the leader? Uh, we should ask the question the most. We had the most authority. The most authority to do what? Ask the question. What can I do to help? Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you're not a Jesus follower, you can try this for free. <laughs> you don't have to become a Jesus follower to do this. You can go home or you can turn around if you're at home and ask your spouse, ask your kids. Um, you can blame it on me. Hey, this preacher I was just listening to suggested I do this. <laughs> just try it. Try it for free. And let me ask you a simple question. What do you think is going to happen? Your family going to get better? Uh, they might pass out first, but once they come to. <laughs> Will it make your family better? What do you think? Like I said, try it for free. Jesus followers, most of you listening, watching are Jesus followers. Do you and I have an option? Do we have a choice? Say, eh, I don't think I want to do that. <laughs> no, we don't. But here's the more important question. Why would you want not to? Does that make sense? <laughs> Why would you not want to do this? If it's going to make you and I more like Jesus, it's going to make you and I have better relationships, like you and I have better families, make healthier families, make, uh, make us have better relationships. Now, I want to end, end with a, this model of Jesus as Paul describes it in Romans chapter 5. For when the time was right, or just in the right time, or just in the nick of time, we might say, the anointed one, Jesus, the Messiah, Christ, came and died to demonstrate his love for sinners. All of us are sinners. We've all fallen short. This translation describes us. We're entirely helpless, weak and powerless to save ourselves or to fix our, fix our relationship with God. So we need, for a better word, to be rescued. We can't rescue ourselves. Someone outside has to rescue us or rescue our sinful situation or our our separation from God. Uh, so in our families, they're never going to be ideal. They're not. <laughs> but we're never to give up on the ideal. We're never to try and get rid of the tension. Oh, it's just too hard. No, 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 no. C continue to strive. And I said last week, uh, we want better for our kids. We want better for our kids' marriages and for our kids' parenting and for our grandkids, etc. We It's just the way we're wired. So then he, Paul goes on and says it this way. Now, who of us would dare die for the sake of a wicked person or a sinner? <laughs> None of us would do that. You're going to pick somebody, you know, use extreme, pick somebody in, uh, on death row in a prison and say, I'll take your place. Anybody going to do that? I don't think so, right? But that's exactly what Jesus did for you and I. So we can understand if someone were willing to die for a truly noble person, bodyguards and stuff, they sometimes do that. But Christ proved, demonstrated God's passionate love for us by dying in our place while we were still lost and ungodly. So we're in that situation with that wicked person that nobody's going to die for, but Jesus died for us. It's amazing. It cost him everything. It cost him his life. And so Will doing this, following the model of Jesus, be costly? Yes. I'm not going to uh, argue against that. I argue it's not. But you and I, millions of people have a relationship with God because of what Jesus did. So you and I can have better families, more ideal families, healthier families. If we, you and I, submit to one another, if you and I ask this question, what can I do to help? Let's say it out loud again, because this is not easy to do. <laughs> what can I do to help? Now, I've been doing this for several years, and it's almost become a habit now. And in fact, I don't even ask it sometimes. I just look around and think, oh, this will help my spouse, my, help my wife, and I do those things. So it's pretty cool. And you get to that place. Not that, that I always do it, <laughs> but uh, uh, I'd encourage you to make this a, a 
have it. In fact, this is going to, uh, well, one more thing, then we'll, we'll give you your put into practice. <laughs> when you want to ask it the least, when you really don't feel like asking it, when you and your wife are at it or you and your kids are at it, that's when <laughs> you and I need to ask it the most. So let me encourage you with those words. Here's your assignment. Put it into practice. See if you can't daily do this at least once with each member of your household. So, in my household, it's just my wife. <laughs> so I'm going to ask, ask her, and I, I, I probably do this daily, but I can ask her what I can do to help. And I encourage you parents, especially with your kids at home, <laughs> and like I said, you might not feel like asking it. Force yourself, if that's the right word, Discipline yourself to say, okay, at least today, maybe it's in the morning, maybe it's in the evening, ask each member of your household. And mean it when you ask it, of course, what can I do to help? And sometimes you're going to go, ugh, with the response, but that's okay. That's going to lead to healthier family. And probably more importantly, it's, it's obedience to our master, Jesus Christ. So let me pray for you, especially as you try and implement uh, this practice. Father God, thank you for your love for us and Jesus' demonstration of using his authority to submit himself to us and for us. That's mind-boggling. And so as family members, uh, not just family members, we, uh, the Scripture says submit to one another, even outside of family. Uh, especially in the families this week. Let, help us to remember to do this. Help us to actually do it and help mean it when we do it <laughs> and to follow through with what we do it. And God, just I, I, I'm excited about what you're going to do in, in family life and relationships. And again, if you're not a Jesus follower, uh, try this for free. But we'd encourage you to become a Jesus follower. This is, uh, you can see the, the value in, in the teachings of Jesus and being obedient to him. It makes us healthier people, healthier families, and it, it opens up a relationship to God where God forgives us and wraps his arms around us and says, uh, you're, now you're part of my family. So as this week goes, goes on, God, we look forward so much to next Sunday because... Uh, some of us, I'll get to see some folks I haven't seen for a while. And it'll be exciting to be, be in the same, same actual space or room. So we thank you for uh, this stage one of, of getting back to quote-unquote normal. And uh, we look forward to when it's, it's even uh, more open. And we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As always, if you made some kind of decision, please let us know about that. If you've got questions, we... Welcome those, and have a great week. We'll be um, checking in on Facebook a couple times this week, and hope to see some of you next Sunday.